Welcome back to the Dave Kittle Show. Today, we have a really interesting financial professional, Chris Younger, the CEO of financial services company in Denver called Classics Partners. He's also the author of Harvest, the definitive guide to selling your company. We'll link to it in the description. You can get it on Amazon and on their main website. Today, we're going to cover a couple of things. We're going to cover the most common value detractors in small to medium-sized businesses. We're going to cover the best and worst transition or exit stories that Chris has come across and interacted with in his 30 years of deal making. And if we have time, also what owners can do in advance of a sale to maximize the value. Before we get into that, Chris, welcome on. Thanks so much, Dave. And thanks for doing what you're doing to uh, help business owners out there. That's awesome. Absolutely. So for the audience out there that might not know about you or haven't come across you yet, can you give a little bit of a, a bio about yourself and, and class six and who you guys help? You bet. You bet. Uh, well, don't hold this against me. I'm a recovered attorney, practiced for a couple of years out in Silicon Valley, and then uh, transitioned over to the deal business. And my first venture out of the law was doing a consolidation in the communications industry. So I was a co-founder of a business and was the deal guy. And we acquired 27 companies over a couple year period. So it was fairly hot and heavy. And as you might expect, you learn quite a bit doing that many deals in that short a period of time. And I like to say, I, I think I've made most of the mistakes that you can make in acquiring a company. And you can't see how tall I am, but I used to be a lot taller before having gone through that experience of integrating those companies. So, and then we sold that business to Avaya, which is a big communications company. Actually tried to retire for a year or so. Uh, my wife, Mary Beth, decided that I needed a high. And uh, uh, so I wanted to stay married. So I, I did. And we started our investment bank about 20 years ago with my partner, David Tolson. And through that experience, we were work entrepreneurs and um, about five or six years into it, we kept seeing common themes in our clients not necessarily being adequately prepared. And so we started a business we today, we call it Pathfinder. And that business is really designed to get businesses ready to go to market. And then obviously we've got our investment bank that manages the transactions. And then about six and a half half years ago, we started a family office to help our clients personally in terms of wealth management, educating their kids, and making sure that they make that transition from being a business owner with sometimes a lot of asset value, but maybe not a lot of cash to, you know, post business owner having a lot of cash and, uh, and just help them manage that transition because sometimes it's pretty tricky. And so we, we help about 70, 75 families and uh, we have active assets under management of about a billion dollars. And then we have, uh, we advise on another billion and a half for those families. And uh, uh, I, like I said, I, I love my job. I get to work with entrepreneurs all day. So it's, um, it's about as good as you can get. Yeah, that sounds great. Before we jump into the common uh, value detractors of small to medium sized businesses, are there any other comments or, or just kind of like initial starting points to kind of provide like an introduction before we kind of do a deep dive into some of these topics? You know, I think the topics will be really good to get into to just to help business owners, particularly those that, you know, might be a little away from an exit, start to plan for that. I think it'll also be helpful for anybody that's looking to buy a company as well, just to, hey, how do you think about value and how do you think about you know, navigating a transaction? So, uh, you know, happy to dive into it. Yeah, that sounds great. So, what are some of the uh, commonalities or some of the things that you've seen that would be the value destroyers or the value detractors? Um, I'm assuming more on what you're seeing on the, the sell side. It could certainly be some of the behavior on the buy side, but I'm assuming it has to do more with the core function of the actual business, the practice that is looking to potentially exit. Yeah, if you could put it into one sentence. I would say the biggest mistake that we see business owners make is really lack of preparation, um, which is, it's, uh, uh, you know, disheartening to see sometimes because you watch an entrepreneur who spent years and years and years of sweat and toil and money and energy and stress building a business only to see a lot of that value leak when they go through a transaction. And it's, uh, I, I try to describe it to business owners who've never been through it. It's, you know, it's a little bit, you know, like heart surgery. It's, it's pretty intense. If you haven't been through it before, you're likely to make a lot of common mistakes. 
And, but all that really starts with preparation. And I think the first step in preparation is really how do you get an objective view of your business? Most entrepreneurs, just because they've been managing their business and are very familiar with their risks and have gotten comfortable with those, a lot of times aren't necessarily the most objective when it comes to evaluating their business. We often see, for example, business owners will value their business as much higher than the market. And I think that's, uh, you know, at some points, right, you, you say that tongue in cheek, but it's actually, I think it's true for a couple of different reasons. And when you think about business value, business value, in my my opinion, is really a combination of two factors. One is how risky is the business perceived to be by a buyer? So how much risk is there perceived to be in that business? And the second one is how credible is the growth plan? If the growth plan is highly credible and the buyer believes in that growth plan, then uh, you're going to feel good about its prospects to generate future cash flows. In addition, if the business is perceived not to have a lot of risk, then those cash flows are fairly predictable. And as a result, that's going to really drive the value of the business a lot higher. Uh, unfortunately, a business owner, because again, they've managed that business for years and years, they're very comfortable with those risks. You know, it's almost like traversing rapids, right? If if you've been down the river 30 times, even in a very, very difficult rapids, you're going to feel pretty comfortable. Um, for, whereas the person going the first time, uh, you know, it could be deadly for them. Likewise, a business owner typically is quite convinced about their growth plan that they have. And I would say 95% of the entrepreneurs that come into our office, uh, I think they've got a good growth plan in their head. But being able to translate that into the language of an investor that's credible oftentimes is very challenging for them just because it's a it's a different language, right? Investors speak a little bit different language than entrepreneurs. And so there's a lot of translation that needs to happen there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to come right back to the uh, the preparation and the potential value de de uh, value detractors. But in the pre-interview, I had asked... What was the origin of classic partners? Like, what does that name mean? Since you mentioned the Rapids, I got to ask you here on the show. So why don't we go into that real quick? Yeah. So uh, class six are the most difficult Rapids, you know, almost unnavigable. And you definitely need a guide if you're going to go down those uh, those Rapids. And at least in our mind, you know, going through a transaction process for most business owners is really, really tricky. And so having somebody that's been there and done that yeah, hopefully will uh, dramatically increase your odds of success and reduce your odds of failure. Yeah, that's awesome. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so going back to the preparation of this experience, of this process, there's a lot of, there's individuals that just try to wing it and do it on their own, or they'll use like their accountant or lawyer that they've known for 20 years. What is just some high level conversation or or considerations? versus that versus using like a specialist or 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 a firm or a, or a company like you or someone like you or your team uh what are the maybe it might cost more maybe the fees are higher but like you're getting a specialist versus someone who may look at commercial real estate contracts here or there but they're not really involved in M&A and in, in, in transitions of actual businesses. So what, like just to, at, a, at a high level for someone who's watching or listening, what are some of the, the challenges there, the, the considerations of going one way or the other? Well, it, uh, back, back to our rapids metaphor, right? You know, you can either hire the guide that's seen those rapids, you know, a hundred times, or you can hire the guide that's maybe been down at once or twice. You know, I think, the the likelihood of success is fairly predictable in both of those situations, right? And in, in most cases, this a business is the business owner's largest asset. And so not having expertise that has been there and done that a bunch of times and really knows the game, you potentially could leave a lot of money on the table. And it's really penny wise, pound foolish, right? You want somebody who who has that and has done it a bunch of times, can bring a lot of buyers to the table for you, knows the pitfalls and anticipates those, you know, is very good at problem solving very quickly, time kills deals. And so if you have folks that are less sophisticated or or don't necessarily know how to address those, those issues, the common issues that come up, 
you know, that can delay the transaction significantly. And like I tell my clients, you know, there's, there's nothing good for a seller that happens between the letter of intent and closing. Uh, it's only risk. So the shortest we can make that period of time, the better it is for the seller. And quite frankly, it's better for the buyer as well. It just gets, it's much more efficient. And that's true, not just for somebody like what we do, a, a banker that can go really tell the entrepreneur's story in a way that the market's going to hear the right way, but also act a number of different bidders that compete with one another and then manage that, you know, that process of negotiating the different offers. It's also true for your lawyer. Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, we, we really have to have hard conversations with our clients that, that hiring their corporate lawyer who, you know, may do one or two deals a year, it may seem like it's going to be less expensive. I can guarantee you that it will be much more expensive. You know, they don't necessarily know, market so they can spend a lot of time and their four dollars on issues that either don't matter or uh, or out of market. they can take a lot longer to prepare documents um, we were just involved in a transaction where it took our client's lawyer about two months to put a purchase agreement agreement together and almost killed the deal right because it's again the longer you extend that time frame to get something done between the letter of intent and closing the worse it is for the seller. And so, um, you know, it's it's one of those where you really, uh, given the magnitude of the traction, right, and the significance of it, it's like going to the general practitioner versus the heart surgeon when you need, you know, a bypass done. Uh, you really want somebody, that's all they do, and they're very, very good at it. Yeah, that's awesome. Makes a lot of sense. I do want to get into some of the best and worst transition or exit stories before we do so. Any other additional value detractors that we didn't cover or just any recap to that section? You know, the the biggest one that we see, right, if if you're just assessing a company, the biggest one that we see, we do a, we have a, a patented tool we call Copilot. It's a health assessment for us. And so we've had almost a thousand companies take that. And so we see kind of what are the most common risks. The number one risk that businesses have is that the business is too dependent on the owner. Uh, or the CEO, and particularly for businesses that are starting to scale, right? If you're starting to get to 10 million in revenues and above, it's hard, right, to make that financial decision to start to hire a, a team. But I can tell you both with respect to the happiness of the owner, as well as the scalability of that business, that uh, getting that team on board, it will add a lot of value to the business. It will allow you to grow and scale faster. And it again, it will make the life of the business owner a lot better because they can start to delegate you know, those tasks that they may not be as good at or that they don't like. And they can get folks that, quite frankly, are hopefully better than they are um, at those different tasks. And so that one we see 95% of our survey users have that risk in one form or another. And so it's one where if you haven't spent time on this, if you're a business owner, I would highly, highly recommend spending time on that. It's obviously a longer conversation, but that's probably the number one that we see. We see a lot of other risks. Um, our assessment identifies about 95 of those risks. Um, you know, the, the other ones are too dependent on one or a few customers for your revenues or too dependent on one or a few lead sources for your customers. Um, we see a lot of financial controls risks in companies. Um, uh, you know, on our website, we've got blog posts that might be of interest to your listeners, you know, particularly on financial controls, um, some best practices that companies can deploy. But it's um, it's really all about, hey, how do I get my business in in a position where the perceived risk is a lot lower and my growth plan is highly credible? And that takes time. And that one consideration of where the business is wrapped too much around the CEO or that they're, or the owner or the, the majority owner is probably, uh, I would love to hear your feedback either that they have not done it before where they haven't tried or they haven't been forced to or in the process of replacing themselves. So there's either a combination of fear where they don't want to be replaced because they don't want to groom that COO or someone internally, uh, some, you know, up and coming VP to kind of be the next CEO of the future. Either there might be fear of replacement or just lack of experience and knowledge around it. Do you have any, maybe there's a third or fourth, but what are, are there other considerations there as to 
an individual of that size or maybe a maybe a one to five million or or like you said up to a ten million dollar business where the practice would be valued typically the best if they were to delegate more and and were to take themselves out a lot of those executive functions but then that replacement would be either they're blocking themselves either because of fear or a lack of experience or or maybe i don't know a third or fourth thing what are your thoughts there i think you put your finger on it a lot of it is look entrepreneurs by nature have a lot of confidence in themselves they believe that they can do things better than others in a lot of respects and i think for certain elements of what they do that's probably true where they start to misstep is that they can do everything right that's better than others uh you know having a great cfo is sometimes the hardest hire that we have to convince clients to make because it's not revenue generating they don't understand necessarily the value of having really good forecasting and predictive financials and uh you know solid financials that are accurate they don't necessarily appreciate that, that until they get one on board. When you get a great CFO on board, and I, I can't tell you how many clients have called me and said, you know, why, why didn't you make us do that earlier? And, and um, you know, to get, to get that quality person on board. So I think part of it's fear. Um, oftentimes, look, hiring is messy. Uh, I would love to say that, hey, the, your odds are 100% that you're going to be successful. And particularly with one of these key hires where culture is so important, you know, hey, your odds might be 50%. But what I do know is if you don't make that higher, you won't scale past 10 million or so in revenues because you just, uh, it, it's physically impossible for the business owner to scale themselves. And so it's, uh, it's definitely a fear issue. That's why I always recommend, you know, find somebody who is not just a great recruiter, right? Because you have to get candidate flow, but also somebody who can help you assess these candidates and that's really important. Somebody who's an expert at interviewing and evaluating executive talent. You know, we've worked with several folks that can help business owners uh, really um, assess that talent to make sure it's going to be a good cultural fit, that that person's going to be competent, that, you know, it's going to work out or at least increase your odds at that. And the old adage of, you know, hire slowly and fire quickly is absolutely true, particularly with a COO, CFO, head of sales type position where they're so critical to the company's, you know, future growth. Excellent. So next, let's jump over to some of your, without mentioning uh, any names or anything <laughs> like that, best and worst transition and exit stories. What are What are some things that... What's some anecdotal stories or situations that we can kind of riff on and, and discuss that would help some of the audience and some of the, the business owners and practice owners out there so that they can maybe learn from or avoid some of these these uh, road bumps or some of these challenges or issues? Yeah, it, it, there's really two stories that illustrate the point that we were just talking about, right, of how important it is to prepare. Uh, I, I'll give you the train wreck story first, um, but we had a... It was uh, a CEO and he had a business that have changed all the names to protect the innocent, but um, he had a business that was a pretty nice business. It was about 50 million in revenues. It was about $10 million earning. So it was a really nice company. I had been building it for 25 years. Like a lot of business owners had gotten, you know, the, a call from a private equity representative saying, Hey, I'm such and such from this private equity firm. I'm really interested in your business. And Whereas most of the time he would have ignored that call for a reason this time he took it. And I like to say, look, you know, most private equity professionals are very, very good salespeople because they're selling the most commoditized of all commodities, which is money. And, you know, this particular private equity representative was able to convince the CEO to uh, sign a non-disclosure, send him some information and, uh, and then have a meeting. And like, I think most CEOs, do. when they're presenting their business, they're going to present their business, you know, in the best light possible versus warts and all, right? That's just our natural tendency. And so as, you know, he's telling this private equity representative, the, the you know, the, uh, the story about his business, the private equity person is getting super excited um, and says, hey, I'd like to make an offer for your business and offers the owner about $65 million. And, and again, the owner was starting to get a little burned out. And the hook in the story is the private equity guy says, uh, I can close this in 45 days. 
So imagine you're the business owner, you're really stressed out, uh, and get $65 million in 45 days. Well, of course, the CEO hadn't done any preparation. So they signed this letter of intent, right? Locks him into exclusive negotiations. And he's he's scrambling to all the diligence materials prepared. He's scrambling to respond to all the requests. So 45 days rolls around. And of course, you know, the, the phone call goes something like, hey, we've we haven't been able to get everything that we need. We need another 45 days. So now we're at 90 days. At the end of 90 days, of course, that buyer has learned all the warts as well. And so the offer is no longer 65 million. It's now 55 million. Well, we got a call about uh, probably 90 days after that. The offer had deteriorated to about 45 or 50 million. And of course, our advice to the business owner, the CEO, was look, just step back. Your business is actually doing better. It was making about $11 million at that point. And it's probably worth north of 75 million. So there's no reason to this. But as sometimes happens, the CEO was just really committed to this deal. And he just said, nope, I just want to get it done. You know, I'm just so burnt out from this process and from running the company. I just want to be done. And so that's probably that's probably the most disheartening, dis, uh, discouraging example I've ever seen of a CEO, you know, basically giving that private equity firm about 30 or $35 million, right, of value. And, and when you think about, you know, he he had big customers um, like Walmart. You know, he probably spent a year to two years preparing for those sales, right? And you know the the value of those sales compared to the thirty five million that he just left on the table is insignificant. So it's a it really points to hey that lack of preparation, but also quite frankly the lack of running a really disciplined process to find a lot of buyers. Um, just. Uh, you know, that that allowed that private equity firm really to steal from that CEO, which was terrible. Um, compare and contrast that to we had another client who, you know, he came to our he came to our office. And um, at that time, the business was really a lifestyle business for himself and his wife. And he said, look, I want this to be much more and I don't want it to be a lifestyle business anymore. And my goal in four years is to sell this business for 30 million dollars. That time his business was probably worth five or six million. And so he said, All right, so tell me what 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 do we have to do? Right. What's the game plan? And so literally it was just, hey, let's evaluate the business. Obviously, he needed to build a team like we were just talking about. And the one great thing about him was he was great at executing. So he went out, he hired a team, we helped him think through product strategy, channel strategy as he was building his product set. And he ended up getting to his 30 million, not in five years, but in three years and uh, sold the business and uh, ended up staying on as the CEO and actually selling yet again for about $120 million. And so he uh, you know, just cleaned up. But that's the difference, I think, between a CEO who is hyper-intentional and is willing to put in the effort front and do the planning and make those hard decisions and do the hiring versus the CEO who just reacts to something coming over the transom but hasn't done any of that preparation. Like I said, it's you know it's like running a marathon, right? If you expect to run a really good marathon, if you haven't trained for six or nine months, you know the odds of you having a good race are pretty slim. Um, the odds of you finishing are pretty slim, and that's you know in the in the former story, that's what happens to a lot of those one-off deals. They fail because you know if you think about it, right? The private equity guys thinking, well, this business isn't what was represented to me. And owners thinking, oh, the PE guy's trying to steal from me, right? You know, they're trying to renegotiate, you know, after they've dragged me through due diligence for 90 days. And so I just think so much can be gained just by doing that core preparation. And that's that's going to generate your very, very best results. And we've we've certainly seen it time and time again. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, sharing those stories. And, and that definitely paints a picture of what are the possibilities in the preparation in in understanding the process and then also working with like a specialized firm like you guys or, or someone else, wherever they're located, there is definitely a, an array of possibilities out there when someone just kind of stumbles into the process and then they're not prepared. And then there could be deal fatigue and the deal drags on. And then like in that first example, 
where the individual or the executive team, the CEO, the majority uh, shareholders will kind of just reluctantly stick with that and just kind of get it over with because of some of that deal fatigue and that improper setup and, and that whole experience, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. And it's and it's all preventable, right? It's all preventable. It just takes a little bit of foresight and a little bit of investment of time and money and energy, but you can generate, like I said, I, and I've always argued that the work that a CEO or an owner does to really work on positioning their business and positioning their business's value and thinking about risk and thinking about a credible growth plan, that's the best return on investment they'll get of any time that they spend in their business. Um, and I've just, I've watched it a lot of times and, um, and it's definitely true. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, go into next, uh, what can owners do in advance of a sale to maximize value? Before we do that, uh, you did write Harvest, the definitive guide of selling your company. Uh, why write a book? I've heard that I've had some people say that I should write one or uh, you know different books or some different ideas, but I've heard that it's a challenging process to write a book. Why, <laughs> why write a book and, and how was the process? Our mission as an organization is to empower the entrepreneurial spirit. We have, have a really, really high regard and respect entrepreneurs. Uh, as entrepreneurs ourselves, we know how hard it is to build a business, let alone build a business to be successful enough where it could be sold. Um, businesses don't make it to that level, right? Most businesses fail. And so, and these entrepreneurs, and I live in Colorado, I mean, mid-sized businesses are the one thing two thirds of the hiring, they're primarily responsible for our uh, economic development and health. And so our mission as an organization and as individuals is what can we do to help those entrepreneurs get the most out of all this risk and time and, and stress that they put into running their companies. And we thought, hey, if, if we could write a book that could summarize a lot of the lessons that we've learned does that allow us to reach a lot more people than we could ever certainly have as clients, but also just give back to that community and give them maybe at least another leg up as it results to, you know, swimming in the, you know, shark infested waters of transactions, right? It's, you know, it's, as I said, a, a, an unwary entrepreneur can lose a lot of money that they shouldn't have to. And so that's why we decided to put the book together. Uh, the process, it's interesting. You know, I, I sat down for about three weeks, uh, did nothing but just write. And um, it's about as painful as you can, as it sounds. And and then my business partner and I, we just spent a lot of time editing and just running running through and editing and editing. And that took about a year uh, to put, put all that down and, and kind of refine it. And, um, you know, we, we joked that, look, if you're ever having a hard time sleeping, it's pretty good to get you back to sleep. But it, we do think that it's, and we've gotten the feedback. Hey, it's it's hopefully helpful for an entrepreneur to 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 use as a reference guide and at least prepare themselves a little bit better for what's coming because it is a uh, again it it's like heart surgery, right? It's a major major uh, life experience, and you you just don't want to go into it unprepared. Right. All right. Let's uh, let's finish up with what owners can do in advance of a sale to maximize value. Now we covered a couple things on this episode, so they certainly could find resources and like your book, read your book, utilize a specialist who can understand, like convey the preparation and the process to you uh, before going into it, as opposed to just winging it yourself. What are some other things that practice owners, business owners can do in advance of a sale to maximize value? So I think the, as we talked about, right, the two key drivers for how do you drive value in a business are how to increase risk and how do I make my growth plan more credible? And both of those uh, activities, when done right, that's a year to two to years of runway to really dial those in. So the first thing is, how do I understand from an outsider's perspective, how much risk is in my business and what are those specific risk factors? and how should I prioritize going about trying to solve those? So that's step one is, again, we use tools on our end to do it, but you could go to an outside business advisor or consultant and just have them assess your company. Um, I'm a big fan of CEO groups, you know, to have 
12 or 13 other CEOs give you their objective feedback on your business is really helpful. Because again, as a business owner, you're not going to see the risk in your business the way a third party would or a buyer would. So getting that assessment and then sitting down and prioritizing, all right, what are these, which of these risks am I going to go tackle based on, you know, number one, how big an impact will they have on valuation? But you also have to look at how long it would take or how expensive it would be or how difficult it would be. And you've got to prioritize those risks. So that's first and foremost is that piece. And I would argue every business owner should be doing that anyway because it'll help you sleep better at night and it'll make your business more scalable. So really focused, focusing on, hey, what is it that makes my business more risky, right? If I've got, you know, we've talked about owner dependence or customer concentration or lack of financial controls, or hey, maybe my legal house is not in order, or maybe I've got some provisions in the contracts that I've signed that are gotchas for a buyer, right? Well, we need to go solve all those things before you go talk to buyers so they're, so they're not gotchas. You know, maybe you've got environmental issues or maybe you've got employment issues. Uh, maybe you've got litigation, all that stuff. It's it's worthwhile to spend time on that. The counterbalance to that is also, how do I build a growth plan that is going to be credible to an investor? Like I said, I think most entrepreneurs have an intuition about, hey, how should I grow my business and what, where are those opportunities? Uh, uh, most entrepreneurs, when pressed, really couldn't put that into the language of an investor, really a spreadsheet with detailed assumptions, detailed analytics, and an analysis that shows why this is believable. And so spending that time to understand wh where is that growth going to come from? Is it my existing customers or I got to go, do I need to go get new customers? Is it my existing product set? Do I need to get new products? Is it, uh, am I going to try to do an acquisition? Um, you know, pretty tricky. So you got to understand where's that growth going to come from. And then you have to build the model around, well, all right, what investments do I need to be making to make that growth possible? Hey, I, if you're a manufacturer, that could be you know, new facilities or new manufacturing equipment. It could be new salespeople. It could be product and development that I've got to do a lot of R&D for. There's a bunch of different things that go into, hey, what are the investments that are required to make that growth possible? They got to understand... All right, how do I translate this? And quite frankly, and for better or for worse, most professional investors, you know, they're going to build a detailed discounted cash flow model. And that's going to have a lot of detailed assumptions. And so how do I take what this model is and put that into a, you know, a full discounted cash flow model that I could uh, talk intelligently about to a potential buyer? Having that put together. And then the final piece is running a lot of common metrics against that. So, hey, am I assuming that sales per employee is going to be higher or lower than they are right now? If they're a lot higher, why is that? How do I justify that to a potential buyer? You know, sales per salesperson, am I expecting my salespeople to be as productive, more productive or less productive going forward? There's a lot of those metrics that you can build into the model to help you gut check whether it's realistic or not. And then having that just allows you to communicate to a buyer so much more convincingly that, hey, this is a plan that you can bet on, right? This is a plan that's highly credible, that you can believe in, and that's going to drive value in the business in addition to, hey, how do, I, how do I take risk out of my business? And I would argue, by the way, again, both of these exercises, every business owner should be doing, regardless if they're going to sell next year or never, um, just because it's just good business practice and it's it's a good discipline. Yeah, it's it's never too early for them to start working on this and, and start considering some of the points that we're talking about. For sure, for sure. Uh, for the audience, if you, I know the audience is going to find this insightful and valuable. So if you're listening, you're watching, jump over to the YouTube, subscribe to YouTube. You'll be notified of new episodes like this that get published twice a week. Uh, Chris, in terms of the audience reaching out to you, there's class6partners.com. So that's classvipartners.com. Uh, maybe LinkedIn or other website or email address. What's a good place for the audience to reach out to you and your company, your firm, if they want to hear more or connect? Yeah, absolutely. They can either reach out uh, via the website, can certainly reach out to me on LinkedIn, or uh, my email is chris, C-H-R-E-S, at class6partners.com. Excellent. Chris, really appreciate your time. Really interesting, really insightful. And I'm glad that we're able to record it and share it with my audience. 
You bet. Thanks, Dave, again, for doing what you're doing and uh, uh, happy to uh, happy to chat with you. Thank you. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com. Or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.